I'm going to record that. Um, she gave you a big message to say that you're, um, um, my session is being recorded. So um, for some of you, you will have known that you were signing up to um, hear from Kath as well tonight. Unfortunately, Kath is not able to be with us tonight. Um, it has something to do with um, some government regulations on um, dietitians speaking about feeding to parents in a public format. So we can't do that. Um, and they flagged it with us. Um, it needs to be in a consultation with her. Um, and so sadly tonight, Kath is not gonna be with us. But if you do join our Weaning Sense course, um, you will be able to hear more from her. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later as well. So tonight is an awesome evening. We're gonna be giving away um, four Weaning Sense courses. So for those of you who stay on tonight and who comment during the chat and are involved right to the end, um, I'm gonna be um, drawing four lucky winners to win um, places on the Weaning Sense course, which is coming up that Kath and I run. Um, and stick around tomorrow, watch in your inbox because we're also going to be sending you a whole lot of lovely voucher codes for some um, food for your little one, some weaning, some you cook weaning sense food. So before we get started, I want to welcome Lovelene here with me today. Um, she's going to pop her video on now. Um, Lovelene, from I don't know how many of you um, follow her, um, but she is one of our um, mummy influencers in South Africa, um, and she's also known as Mrs. Leo. Hi, Lovelene. Thank you for joining us. Hi, hi, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. It's hi, awesome baby. to have you. It's awesome to have you. So, Lavine is the founder of a lifestyle management company, La Privé Concierge and Events. So, Lavine, what do you do other than when you are being a parenting influ an influencer? What is what does a lifestyle management company do? Okay, we offer elite concierge services, uh, specializing in events and travel management. However, we also do cover personal and business management services. Brilliant. Okay. Sounds like something that I could definitely can make you use me? of. Yes, I can hear yes. you perfectly. Thank you. Lavlina yes. is the mum of, of four little yes. ones. She's okay. got Constance, who is 14, Comfort, who's 12, Katrina, who's five, and Connor, who's five months old, and she's going through a weaning journey. So we've asked her to join us. And later on this evening, um, after I've finished doing my talk, Lavlene's going to join us again. And we're just going to hear a little bit about her weaning journey. Um, and she's going to ask us some questions. And at the same time, you'll be able to ask us questions as well. So that's what's going to be happening tonight. Right. So we, you're awesome. So, right, so without further ado, I'm going to get on and I'm going to start talking a little bit around weaning your baby. And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the ready, steady stages, and then Lovelene's going to join us and she's going to talk about the go stage and about exactly um, kind of which food she's loving, what she's introducing, what her journey's been like. And while her and I are chatting, you guys can muster up all the questions that you want and you can send those through to me and you can do it in the chat or in the Q&A here below. And any questions you've got around weaning, I would be very, very happy to answer them here for you tonight. Right, so, um, okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to know when your little one is ready um, and steady and, and what you can introduce at each point. So I guess the very first thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about the ready stage, because in, in the book, um, Weaning Sense, which um, for those of you who don't have it, that's what it looks like. We talk about the ready, steady, go stages. And loosely, the ready stage is kind of that stage between four and six months of age. Um, the steady stage is from six months until about 10 months. And then the go stage can be anywhere from eight months on to a year. And each of them have a different role and a different responsibility in your baby's weaning journey. And when we're thinking about weaning, and I think this is why most of you take weaning so seriously, because when we think about weaning, we're not just thinking about how do we get nutrients into our baby's mouths right now? And how do we transition from milk to solids? But we're also thinking about what repercussions could come through weaning later on. So in other words, will I increase the risk of allergies? Will my child have more... Um, um, more likelihood of becoming obese? Will there be any health issues? Um, will my baby be a picky eater? So these are all the things that we're thinking about as we approach weaning. So we're thinking about the nutrition for now, we're thinking about the transition for now, but we're also thinking about the future. Um, and so by breaking weaning into these three stages, we can actually address all of those questions. So the weaning stage is 
the, the ready stage is, as I said, loosely between about four and six months of age. Now, that does not mean that you need to introduce solids to your baby at four months of age. And um, it also doesn't mean that your baby has to have solids introduced on six months of age. And, you know, I think for many of you, and this is the problem with parenting advice, is that it can be very um, polarized. So you speak to one person and they'll say to you, babies must have solids at four months. And another person will say to you, babies can't have solids until six months. They must have an exclusive milk diet until six months. And in actual fact, what we really do understand is that it is not a, it's not a set science. It's not an exact date that you can give your baby food. It's somewhere in this range. And that range is four to six months. Now, some of the controversy that came up previously, um, and, and some of the advice you might have heard is that babies can only have solids introduced at six months. And um, my firstborn, and I mean, Loveline as well, has got older children, and some of you have got older children, were in that kind of bucket of, of where the advice really was introduce solids at six months of age. And in actual fact, when I introduced solids, it was so long ago to my eldest that it was don't introduce until six months of age and don't introduce protein until nine months of age. So things like egg and fish and nuts were only after nine months of age. Um, and we were told to not eat nuts in pregnancy. So there was a lot of those type of, um, th that type of advice. And it was all centered around the possibility of a baby developing allergies. So at the time, the thought process was the later you introduce um, solids, the better for allergies and don't introduce allergens until nine months. Of course, that science has been disproven. Um, and the reason for that is that um, in countries where um, late introduction of solids was pushed and particularly late introduction of allergens like for instance peanuts um, was pushed up to after nine months like Australia they have very high incidence of of, prote of um, peanut allergies as an example where countries where babies have peanuts in their diet from very early on and all the way through pregnancy and breastfeeding they're exposed to peanuts like for instance Southeast Asia that they actually have a lower incidence of allergies and so the allergy research around weaning had to kind of do a full circle and then we start to start to say okay so when should babies have solids introduced so the, the reality is babies can have solids introduced as early as four months, not earlier. The gut isn't ready for it, but anywhere between four, four months and six months is the right age. So how do you know that your baby is ready? Um, what, what, what are the signs that, that you will see um, that tell you that your baby is actually ready for solids? So the first thing is, as I've mentioned, there's this window period. Um, the, the next thing that happens is that your baby starts to really explore with their mouth. So anything in the environment starts to go to their mouth and they actually start to do this before they're ready for solids, but you do want them to be doing it by the time they have solids. And so they start to explore with their mouth, they start to put things in their mouth and they start to be fascinated with your mouth and with you putting things in your mouth. So if your little one is sitting on your lap while you're eating a chicken drumstick and taking it to your mouth, um, they're likely to watch you and might even reach for it and really want to take it to their mouth. So that's one of the first signs that you want to look for is that they really are exploring with their mouth, that they're interested and that they're starting to explore the environment a lot. So exploration is, is your number one. Number two, there are certain physical cues that we do want to look for. So, um, so your baby does not have to be sitting on their own, okay, but they do need to be able to sit upright sufficiently that they lift their chin off their chest um, and that they can actually hold their top part of their body upright without support. But the support can be given around their waist and their hips. So if you put your um, hands around your baby's waist and their hips and they sit upright with their chin off their chest, then they have got sufficient gross motor control or central central control in order to actually be able to sit and eat. You also want to make sure that they have got oral motor control. So for instance, if you put something on their lips, they'll lick it and they'll take it back to the back of their mouth. So that kind of sense that, that there's something going on and that they can actually kind of um, use their mouth to start to explore um, what, what's going on around their lips. So those are some of the physical cues. They also start to use their hands to be able to reach for things. And that example of a little one sitting on your lap um, and reaching for the drumstick. And, and if, they, if that drumstick hit their hands, they would take it straight to their mouth. Then, you know, okay, they're showing you a lot of those physical cues. And then, of course, there are the engagement cues. So these are things like the eye contact, the interest in the food, um, and really wanting to engage with it. So when your little one starts to show you all of these signs, and they're between that window of four and six months of age, your baby's ready for solids. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to introduce solids immediately. So you don't have, they can be showing you all those signs, but they can be doing really well on a milk diet and you can be completely comfortable with exclusive breastfeeding as an example, or, or even bottle feeding that, you know, that you're doing milk feeds exclusively and um, that you won't need to introduce solids and then you don't have to. So don't feel the pressure, don't feel the rush, don't feel like you need to move into it um, because some babies can actually last on milk for much longer. 
But if your little one is starting to not be able to last on milk very well, so they're showing you all of these signs, they're between four and six months of age. And in addition to that, they're not stretching nicely between their feeds. So for instance, they used to do four hours or three hours and now, now only doing two hours, or they're waking up much more regularly at night, then you can start to think, okay, maybe they're actually ready for it. Now, one of the kind of um, misconceptions that goes around um, milk feeds or, or, or introducing solids is that um, you must introduce solids and in order to get your baby to sleep through the night. And in actual fact, we know that that isn't exactly true. Um, and the reason is that the amount that you're introducing to your baby when you are in this ready phase of eating is not sufficient um, to change their sleep materially. So a lot of us think um, I'll introduce solids and miraculously my baby will sleep through that night. It absolutely is not the case. So what are the reasons to introduce solids and, and, and what are the targets, what are the goals of this, of this stage? And we go through it really, really nicely in the book and we talk about what, what these kind of goals are that we look for, so or that we're looking at. So the first one is that the main goal of the ready stage, remember this is the four to six month old baby, the main goal is just exposure. It's actually not nutrition because the nutrition piece has to be met by milk. So milk is our primary nutrition until six months of, six months of age and it's the main source of nutrients and so it isn't supposed to be that you're introducing solids in order for them to get their nutrients it's just exposure it's like giving them a toy to hold in their hand that they will explore it's exactly the same for food so that's the first thing with um with this ready stage is it's just for exploration and that means that if you've started solids and you think your baby's not doing well on it you can just stop and if you miss a day it's also okay. So it's not kind of this religious, like once we started, now we're going down this avenue. It's not about that. It's just about exploration. The second thing though, which is an aim for this age group is that by the time we do get into the steady stage, we want to, we are going to be needing um, food for nutrition. And so we want to, our babies to be on a certain amount of food and a certain amount of variety as well. And so the second goal with this ready stage of, of weaning is that it is to get in um, a, a nice runway in order to get them to that steady stage. So for those of you who decide to only start solids, for instance, at six months of age, or if you haven't started solids and your baby is six months, you're gonna to have to introduce solids at a very, very rapid rate in order to get in all those wonderful nutrients that are needed from six months onwards. Whereas if you start at four months or five months, it just goes a whole lot more slowly through until six months when, when you can introduce um, the, um, when, when you'll have introduce of, uh, introduction of a great variety of flavors. All right, so that's the second thing. Um, so it's about exposure, it's about, um, and, and it's about kind of getting sufficient variety in over that time that by the time you get to six months, you've got a nice variety. So that's a little bit about the ready stage. And um, just a little around how to introduce in the ready stage. So obviously um, your baby's not gonna go into three meals a day, and but depending on their age, if they're closer to four months, it'll be much slower introduction of solids. If they're closer to six months, it's gonna be much more rapid. And that means that they're going to have, um, a, you know, kind of be up to three meals a day quite rapidly. Um, for those of you who have the um, Parent Sense application, um, you are, will be guided through your weaning journey in the app. So the app will actually guide you through to when to introduce the solids and how many each day. So the time of day that I normally recommend is around about 11 o'clock in the morning. So it's kind of just after your 10 o'clock feed. So let's say your baby was feeding at six and then at 10, then at 11 o'clock, you would then give them their first taste of solids. And the reason we give it after milk is, is that we don't want little ones to be so hungry that they go in more for the food than they go for the milk. Because remember, milk is the priority until six months of age. So it, we normally do that little um, feeding part, that, that, that little first introduction of solids just after a milk feed. And then you can go with one meal for as long as you want, or you can go into really nice rapid um, introduction of variety. Nothing wrong with that. So you could start with um, one meal the first day and even go on to two meals within four days time. And uh, again, depending on how old your baby is. So the big question is what should you be introducing first? And again, you know, there's just so many different um, pieces of advice. In the 1970s, they used to say avocado. Um, and in actual fact, we now understand that avocado is an incredible food. It's actually the food that most closely represents breast milk in terms of composition of fats, sugars, and proteins, and, and so on. So it is it, re it really is a superfood ever. Um, but we don't necessarily start with ever. After the 1970s, we had this big um, kind of push towards um, um, cereals and um, I really, really do not like cereals. Um, I think cereals are really just processed carbohydrates. There's a place for them. And we definitely do have carbs. You'll know from the book, we've got lots of lovely carb recipes, including bread, nothing wrong with a good carb. However, a processed carb is something that you do wanna stick away from and particularly as an early weaning food. 
So what does that leave? It leaves meat or vegetables or fruit and meat will introduce later. So the answer to the question of what comes first is either fruit or vegetables. And, you know, again, we're not very set on, on either way. Um, your baby is likely to prefer um, uh, fruit earlier than they will vegetables because veggies have a slightly bitter taste um, depending on how you cook them and fruit is nice and sweet. But having said that, there's lots of wonderful veggies like for instance, butternut and sweet potato, which is so sweet um, and so so tasty for little ones. So my advice would be to go for those orange and yellow veggies that don't have the bitterness um, and then nice veggies have got some super carbs in them and obviously all of the vitamins as well. So our first food we do recommend is vegetables, but if you're gonna throw in some fruit along the way early on, Absolutely perfect, no problem with that. Right, so let's move on to the steady stage. And into the steady stage, we're starting to move towards introducing solids to, to, in order to avoid allergies. Now, I mentioned allergies earlier on. I mentioned that very late introduction of allergens can actually increase the chance of allergies. So there's like this window period where we do want little ones to start to actually um, experience um, allergens. And one of those most common allergens is, is um, here, right here in this picture, which is peanuts. And obviously you're never gonna give your baby a whole peanut, they'll choke, but peanut butter, and particularly if you're making those nut butters at home are really, really super. And it's a great way to introduce early allergens to your little one. And you can start to do that um, from quite close to six months. So just a couple of weeks after you've started to introduce your solids, you can already go onto something that actually has some, some um, peanuts in it. And an example of that in the weaning sense range is the butternut and peanut butter flavored food which is really, really awesome. So that's the type of food that you can start to introduce. The principle here is don't leave allergens too late. If you're still pregnant, I don't think there are many of you that are pregnant, but if you're still pregnant, eat your allergens as long as you're not allergic to them. If you're allergic, obviously you've got to um, not eat your allergens, but um, if, you are not, if you're not allergic, then eat your peanut butter, your fish, your eggs, and, and so on. Um, when you're breastfeeding, eat lots of allergens as well, as long as you're not allergic, because a little bit of that comes through to your baby and helps them to build up a tolerance for, or stop them from, uh, not, not so much a tolerance, but stop them from reacting to, um, to peanut, peanuts or fish later on. All right, so that um, means that in your steady stage, what you're really already looking at is that you're moving on into introducing some nice little allergens into their diet. The second major thing around the, um, the, the this, um, steady stage of eating is that we want to wean our babies to prevent picky eating. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about picky eating here and I'm gonna go into a bit of depth around the sensory personalities. So we all know that babies have preferences. These are little ones with mangoes. Some of them delighted at eating the mangoes and some of them really, like, there you go, he's loving this. In fact, this is not even mango, this is lemon, loving that lemon. And this little one pulling a real face around lemon and that one looking absolutely distressed around lemon. Now, babies have different preferences. So the question is, why is it that babies have such distinct preferences? Well, it's because they each have their own sensory personality. And these are the four different sensory personalities that we speak about in the book. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of um, insight into that. So all babies um, are, are either born with a high neurological threshold. In fact, all of us have a high neurological threshold or we have a low neurological threshold. So if we have a high neurological threshold, it means that a lot can be going on in our world that we really don't even notice. So we have a high threshold, we have a, a high filtering system for sensory information. And if your baby has that, they will end up being either a settled baby or a social butterfly. And both of these babies are babies who really don't perceive everything that's going on in their world. They tend to be um, quite laid back babies. In fact, they very often are babies that um, sleep through early. And they're also very often are babies who actually take to weaning very happily. So our settled baby takes to weaning. They are, they're interested in the food. Um, but they, they don't really show the signals necessarily for being hungry all the time because they're not really feeling those signals. Where our social butterfly has worked out that if they take in more interesting sensory information, they can actually really enjoy life a little bit more. So they are very social, they're gregarious, and they are sensory seekers. And I'm gonna talk about how this pertains to weaning just now. In our low threshold side of things, these are little ones who are much more sensitive. So they don't have that threshold and that filter to filter out sensory information as well. And so they become either our sensitive little ones. So if the door bangs, they put their hands over their ears or if the dog barks, they start crying. Or they can become slow to warm up, which means that actually they kind of will warm up, but they initially are quite sensitive to things. But if they get used to it, they'll warm up to it. Now, of course, you can probably start to see where this is going in terms of weaning. 
So before um, we, we look at where it goes in terms of weaning, I want to show you a, a little video of twins and you'll be able to see just how different their sensory personalities are. Miku. So it's quite interesting. You can see that this little baby over here, uh, who is social, he, he loves his big sister, but his eyes are quite big and he's almost quite a little bit fearful of the interaction. And so he's what we call a slow to warm up baby because you'll see towards the end, he really does warm up. Um, and there he is. There. And you can see this twin is very, very social. And so this little one is engaging very readily. So these are this is the type of thing that we see with twins. So in the book, in the book Weaning Sense, we actually do have this checklist and you can actually do this checklist. You can also do it on my website just to find out what type of um, baby your baby is. Is your baby a social butterfly like the twin on the left? Um, are they very happily engaged and very gregarious eaters? And we'll talk about the weaning now. Or are they like the baby on the right who was that slow to warm up baby? So do the checklist and you'll find out what your baby is. Now, why is this important? The reason it's important is that it does impact whether or not they're going to be a picky eater um, because there are different ways to wean according to these different personalities. So with our social butterfly, um, who was the baby on the left, they tend to show very early signs of wanting to wean. They um, are interested in your food. They're watching you eat. They get everything to their mouth and they really, really want to go for it really early on. They've often also got um, quite robust gross motor skills. So these little ones tend to have early signs of wanting to uh, of wanting to wean, but my advice there is don't rush in, wait for all the other signs. Remember I spoke about what happens with milk, what happens with sleep. I spoke about all the other interest signs as well as the physical and motor signs. So don't rush in too early. But these little ones get bored very quickly with bland um, and routine meals. And this is where we start to see the picture of the picky eater coming out. So if you've got a social butterfly, you might have found that they went straight into solids, so excited, even if it was just rice cereal, and then after a couple of days of going through the same stuff, they got bored and didn't want it anymore. And the reason is that they need a lot of variety, a lot of flavor. And that's one of the reasons why in our recipes with, with the Weaning Sense recipes, we really looked at bringing in lots and lots of variety of flavor and actually quite strong flavors as well. Like for instance, we've got um, a carrot cake porridge, which has actually got cinnamon in it. So, you know, it's a really lovely strong flavor of porridge compared to that bland rice cereal. These social butterflies tend to go off their milk a little earlier than other babies because actually milk is really boring. It's always the same flavor. It's always the same text texture. It's always the same temperature. And so as soon as they're onto solids, they want to abandon milk. And remember what I said earlier is that milk is our priority until six months of age. So don't ramp up the solids too quickly. Rather let that milk be the priority and hold them back. And you can do that by always having your milk feeds before your solid feeds. Okay. And then remember that if, for those of you who've got picky toddlers, um, if they are social butterflies, they are wanting lots of variety, lots of color, new places to eat, strong flavors. So they really are much more gregarious eaters. And it's worth you actually applying your mind to offering color, flavor, texture very, very quickly to your social butterfly toddler. So let's talk about your set settled baby. Okay, so uh, how many of you have got a settled baby? Um, because settled babies really make our lives very easy. They uh, tend to sleep through easily, early. They, uh, my second child was a, a, a settled baby and I always say she was a con baby because she conned me into having a third and writing a book um, called Baby Sense. So um, I do think our settled babies make us feel very successful as parents though. So they, they actually are quite a win. So our settled babies, um, what happens with weaning for them is that they might have a little bit of a lower appetite um, because they don't always perceive internal hunger signs. And so they actually need to be fed on routine because they don't cry for food because they actually don't get those internal signals that say, I'm hungry, you know, so they don't cry as much. But once they're eating, they tend to overeat because they don't get those full signals. Remember, they, they've got a high filter, so they're not perceiving everything that's going on in their body. And so they don't really notice that they're actually full. And so you can help your little one with um, giving them words. So I think you might be full now, or are you feeling full, or are you hungry? And so early on, you start to give them the language um, in order to, um, to actually kind of um, communicate that they're hungry or full. They tend to engage readily with new experiences without resistance. 
And mealtime's a great time to kind of spice up life. So give these ones lots and lots of strong flavors because what you do is you in, um, increase the way that they engage with the world and they start to maybe start to work out that there's a whole lot going on that they might be missing out on. Our third um, baby is a sensitive baby. And these little babies can be so tricky because they often are the babies that cry a lot, uh, particularly in the early days. They can be sensitive to breastfeeding. They can be sensitive to switching to, to bottles. So maybe the ones who don't actually switch to bottles. And the first time they taste food, they often really gag. Um, and in addition to that, they are often hypervigilant. In other words, they're sensitive to the whole world. They're, they're always thinking that there might be something that's gonna give them a fright. And so because they are hypervigilant, they have less appetites. They might find it hard to, to swallow and they actually feed best after you fed them, after they've slept or if you're feeding them in a very calm space. So have a look at what's going on for them. If they're overtired, they're going to potentially be quite picky eaters as well. For these are the ones, novelty presents a, a threat. So I don't know how many of you have got other ones who are stuck on the whites. So they only like to eat the white food, which is um, our pastas, our milk products, our dairy products, and that type of thing, our fried products. They tend to be um, less threatening for these babies. And so they really can be very sensitive around meal times. And the important thing with them is that they mustn't then fill up on milk because we want to make sure we're prioritizing their appetite. And then what about our slow to warm up baby? So our slow to warm up baby really is like our sensitive baby, since textures and strong flavors present a challenge. So they don't like, for instance, certain colors of foods to mix. So the carrots must be separate from the mashed potato, not in the mashed potato. They really don't like it if there's a chunk in something that's smooth, like for instance, a chunk of carrot in a in a in smooth um, mashed potato. So they really get um, can get quite stuck on foods. They get they go for safe foods, and again, very often, similar to the sensitive baby, they can be quite stuck on white foods. Um, importantly, with these babies and with our sensitive babies, we want to use either homemade food. Or if you're using shop-bought food, make sure it's got high texture. And that's one of the reasons why our weaning sense range is so textured. We don't have a lot of smooth food because we know that babies can get very stuck on food if it's way too, way too smooth. And then for these little ones, they like to start controlling their, their meal time. So they like to feed themselves. Right. So that really covers us for a little bit on the, on, um, the weaning journey in terms of the ready and the steady. Um, and now I'm going to, while you guys think up all your wonderful questions, which I'm going to be able to answer in the next few minutes, and I'm sure you've got lots of them, so do pop them down in the Q&A and in the chat. I'm going to ask Lovelene to come back on with me, and I'm going to just ask you a little bit around your weaning journey, Lovelene. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Meg. So you've got four little ones. You are a seasoned mother. Did your babies feed differently, and can you identify their sensory personalities from what I just was saying? Yes, yes. Um, I've got four babies, um, three girls and one baby boy. With the three girls, what I saw, uh, the two eldest ones, uh, they were more of the, um, uh, they adapted very easy into food. Like they were not really, um, not picky eaters. Uh, unlike uh, my third um, young girl who she, uh, she was, she's very picky. She only enjoy eating smooth food. She hated um, having something that is a bit chunky like if, if, if you give her something that has some chunk in it she will not uh, eat it at all uh, with Connor um, Connor is such a very um, social butterfly uh, she started uh, on solid when she oh, he's five months because each and every time we're eating he wants to grab and everything else like and then I found out that she was not getting full um, with, with just the milk alone. So mm. I spoke to my pediatrician and he was like, no, it's good to go uh, to solid. So he was so um, so easy um, uh, to, 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 to start the winning uh, journey with him. Like, uh, like I said earlier on, like with the girls, yeah, yeah, yeah. The girls, I, I found it so different, like the boy from the girls. The girls, uh, the two girls, yeah, it was nice and smooth with them. With Katriona, I, I, I was facing challenges. Like she's such a very picky eater. Till today, I was still, we still fight a lot. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah, and you know, the sensory personalities do actually, me? yes, I can hear you well. The sensory personalities do follow them through life. I mean, it definitely is, you know, that very often if you see them that they're picky early on, they picky later as well. Um, so it is tricky with a social it's butterfly. Good. I mean, I can completely see that Connor's a social butterfly. That little smile on the face there is just too precious. Um, you can see that he, he's, he really is a social butterfly. 
So with him, I mean, you you did an unboxing of of the Weaning Sense food, which I'm going to show the video of just now. Um, did he? Um, which which is his favorite flavor? Oh my goodness, he loves the chicken and the beetroot and banana puree. That's his favorite. Like I wouldn't have thought that he would love that. <laughs> You know, that's his favorite. And the apple, the apple, the apple, the apple puree, he loves it as well. Uh, the the cinnamon, I think it's a little bit too strong for him yet, you know, okay. but uh, I'll keep on trying. Yeah, he's like, he was like, no. <laughs> that's very yeah. interesting, very interesting. Yeah. But his favorite um, the chicken, the chicken, he loves the chicken and um, the beetroot. Puree, beetroot yeah. So the chicken and beetroot puree is very interesting and your, you know, your social butterfly will go for that because it's that bright red color and they love it. So um, it's, it's interesting, very interesting. Yes, I think you also love the color, the color. <laughs> Brilliant. So Lavlene, do you have any questions for me before I get on to everybody else's questions? Do you have any questions around weaning? I want to ask you uh, for the snakes, like for weaning, what snakes will you um, would recommend to give to Connor? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. A lot of people have that question. Um, so in terms of snacks, you don't need to introduce snacks under six months of age. So if a baby's on uh, under six months of age, they should be on their four milk feeds in a day. So for instance, six, 10 to six. I mean, it's not, it's not always exactly those times. And then they'll be having their breakfast, lunch and supper. By the time they hit six months, they can be on two or three meals. Um, so you don't need to put any snacks in. And then from six months old, we can start to introduce snacks at the mid-morning bottle and the mid-afternoon bottle. So my recommendation is you're still going to be giving them those bottles mid or the, or the breastfeeds mid-morning and mid-afternoon. But then you add in a couple of little snacks, like, for instance, little teething biscuits. Um, we do have a recipe for those uh, in the book. We've also got one in the Allergy Sense book. Um, so you can pop in some, some teething biscuits. Um, we also have a recipe for fat bombs, which are, are, are really awesome, um, especially for those of you who've got picky eaters. They like little... Um, little um, balls that are full of really, really um, high calorie um, um, diets. So for instance, we've got a cream cheese and biltong um, ball, which, which is really awesome for little ones who are picky eaters. So you can introduce that. I also love biltong, um, but biltong would need to be made with low salt. Unfortunately, the shop bought biltong generally has high salt, so you need to go for a low salt option. Um, and then also things like um, your your fruit pieces, like for instance, watermelon that can crush. So if there's anything, um, moms, that you can actually crush between your fingers and it ends up as a mush, that's a great food to give to your little one because they'll crush it between their gums, they'll get out the liquid and then they'll learn to swallow it or they might spit out the, the pulp. Um, and that's absolutely fine. So going for fruit, going for biltong, going for little biscuits, those are all great um, snacks. And then what you'll find is as your baby approaches about seven or eight months, they'll actually start to drop either their mid-morning or their mid-afternoon mid bottle or, or, or milk feed. And when they do that, you can then start to add in something like yogurt at that stage as well, which is a lovely, another addition for, the, for snacks. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks, do you have any, <laughs> any other questions before I go across to anyone else? Um, can I ask you another thing, like, uh, what's the best time to feed a uh, supper like which because um sometimes i give him at seven and it depends on when he's awake you know um i find it very challenging with him because he sleeps quite a lot yeah so, so uh, like i'm giving him too late and it's kind of like uh disturb his sleeping pattern yeah so Again, another good question. I mean, for those of you who are looking for routines for your babies, particularly as they get a little older, then the Parent Sense app is a great app to use because it'll guide you through exactly when, when to um, have those sleep times. My rule of thumb is usually to work backwards from bedtime. So most babies should be actually in bed by seven o'clock. So because it'll help them to sleep better through the night. So if we work backwards, we go seven o'clock minus one hour gives us a bath time routine. So we've got an hour for bath time routine. And then just before that can be dinner. So for instance, you could have dinner at five or 5.30 and then start bath at six into a bath time routine with a massage and then bedtime at seven. And that routine for those two hours, um, it's, I mean, it's intense as a mom because you're doing, you basically are doing, it's, it's admin for those, those two hours. You know, it's feed and it's cleaning and then it's, you know, propping them in the bath and then it's the, the, the um, massage and so on and then into bed. So I like five o'clock 
between five and six o'clock for, for meal times. And I also don't like having meal times after bath. I mean, most of us don't because otherwise they're such a mess after meal times that actually, you know, putting they actually need that bath after they've done their meal times. Okay. Brilliant. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna go across lovely into a couple, a couple of other people's questions. I hope I'll come back to one question from you later on. Um, and just before Thank I get you. on to everyone's questions, I'm just gonna quickly show um, the, the, the weaning sense range. So this is Lavleen actually opening up her little box of, of weaning sense food. This is how it comes for those of you who want to know. So it um, comes really nice and cold and chilled. And that's actually the one that she was talking about, the chicken beetroot. Um, um, and they absolutely love that one. Um, so this was the um, social butterfly box, I think, bright colors. Um, and there you go, you've got your baby marrow. There's apple pear and baby marrow, which is a really lovely um, texture. There we go. And I think this was right at the beginning when Connor was busy weaning. A very cute little video. Right. So we're now going to go on to everybody's questions. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing for a second so that I can just focus in on all your questions and answer them all. Um, so let's see. Liana, um, are there any specific foods that should be avoided when a baby, um, when weaning a baby that suffers from reflux? Well, the not really, Liana, unless the reflux is due to an allergy. So for instance, some little babies have um, increased reflux because they have um, a lactose intolerance. In fact, my third child was one of those babies and she still is lactose intolerant. Um, and for them, I would then be avoiding the foods with lactose. Just remembering that lactose is in all animal milks, including breast milk. Um, but otherwise you can go right ahead. And um, there are some people, and there's no scientific evidence for this, but I will tell you this, that some people say that butternut exacerbates reflux, but um, all I think is that it, there's, you know, it's so orange that we just notice it more. Um, all right, Ismat, my baby doesn't seem keen on drinking water. How do I get him to take more water? So yeah, lots of babies don't drink water. And if, and if they are breastfed, don't even worry about it. They're getting, you know, breast milk is amazing and it'll just kind of adjust its consistency to the amount of, of um, hydration your baby needs. Um, but if your baby is on, let's say, formula plus solids, then they do need water. And my suggestion with water is to offer it after every single um, feed um, and every meal so that they actually get the sense that that's what comes afterwards. Um, and then they'll hopefully just move in on it. And I would suggest never introducing fruit juice so that they always do go for water rather than fruit juice. Right. Um, from Natalie, my twins are almost eight months old and started solids at five and a half months. I follow the weaning sense diet. They're in the steady stage age, but are many still eating um, the amounts of the ready stage? Is that a problem? They're already drinking less milk and thriving. Um, I'm also unsure of what finger foods to offer. So I've answered the finger food question for you, Natalie, um, but it's a really awesome question around quantities because um, a lot of people have said that both in the app and in the weaning sense, we, we talk about wide ranges of, of, um, of kind of how much they should be eating or, or, or drinking. And the reason that we do that is because the minute you, every baby's different. And so some little ones like yours, Natalie, are actually eating less than they so-called should be and are thriving and are sleeping and are doing well. And so for them, I wouldn't even think twice about it. I wouldn't worry. If your baby is not eating the quantities and they're not thriving, that's when we would worry. All right. Um, to Maleng, um, hi Meg, my five month old baby started solids about a week ago and a half ago. She's not necessarily constipated, but making a poo that is no longer effortless. Um, I give her 80 mils of water, still breastfeeding. I'm worried that she's constipated. Another awesome question. Okay, so very importantly here, um, constipation is a very specific condition and it's really not good for babies. We need to address it, but it is when they're making tiny little hard pellets like rabbit poos or what we call book drolikis. That's what constipation is. So if your baby is just not, um, is just not making an effortless poo, in other words, they're pushing and they're straining, but when it comes out, it looks like paste. That's not constipation. You don't need to worry about it. It just means that the consistency has changed as they've gone onto solids. Um, and giving 80 mils of water is absolutely perfect along with your breast milk. Um, okay, so, Another good question. Oh, awesome questions tonight. This is from Jackie. She said, at what time of day is it best to test potential allergens? I've heard that one should not give any potential allergen late in the afternoon or night. So um, test allergens in the morning if you're concerned about allergies. Um, and remember that allergens, allergies don't show up on your first exposure to food, but rather on your second exposure. So for instance, if your baby's exposed to egg for the first time, they're unlikely to react. They might react, but unlikely but they're much more likely the second or third time. So that's when you'd actually watch your baby. 
and introduce it in the mornings. Good, good advice. Okay, Marlene, she says, my little one is a social butterfly, almost six months old, and I struggle at meet, meal times to keep her attention on eating. I use a variety of purees to keep her interested, but she keeps looking um, around excessively during meal times. Yeah, so that definitely does happen. Sorry about my dogs outside. They're barking at people walking past. Um, but that does definitely happen with our social butterflies that they do start to get distracted. So importantly with them, make mealtime social. So sit down and eat in front of them as well so that they can see that you're eating something. So have some carrots with some hummus so that you're eating and they're eating. Um, talk to them, um, show them stories, have one of those little mats where they can kind of move things around on the mat. Um, give your toddler, give your six month old something to eat in her hand. So give her something like a very soft piece of um, broccoli, for instance, that she can kind of get to her mouth and she'll spit it out. It's not really, she's not really feeding herself, but she's just experimenting. So give her things to do. That would be my recommendation. And then for other social butterflies, as they get older, social meal times is the way to go. Um, all right, another good question, Natalie. In terms of carbohydrates, is it okay to give them organic creamy oat cereal? Or should I make them millet, spelt, and oats from scratch? The cereal I give my twins contains formula and is made with water. So look, the, the less processed the food that you give to your little one, the better. So when you are mixing your own rice grains or, or milling your own rice grains, your own millet, your own spelt, your own oats, you know what's going in there. You know that it is really just that oats. The minute you've got something that's been processed for you in a shop or in a factory, there's a whole lot of other variables. Um, but if you are going to do it, because we're all moms, we're all busy, we have to have convenience foods, and maybe your um, your organic creamy oats is something that is your convenience food, because maybe in the morning you're getting ready to go to work, or you're busy or whatever, just have a look on the box. The fewer number of ingredients that there is on a box, the better the food is for your baby, because you know that it hasn't got a whole lot of other things added in, and you know exactly what's gone in. So if it's just oats, let's say, for example, in that box, then nothing wrong with it. You said it is formula added as well. Second thing is no numbers, no preservatives, and no colorants on those, on those ingredients list. So have a look at that ingredient list and make sure that there are no numbers on there. And you know what those numbers are, like E56.0, you know, all those numbers, none of those. All right, Taryn, how can you ensure your baby's had um, enough variety of nutrients when you're on a budget? Okay, another great question. So luckily, one of the most um, inexpensive foods when you're on a budget is actually vegetables. And so just get the veggies of the season. And in fact, seasonal vegetables are much cheaper than unseasonal vegetables. And of course, we know that unseasonal vegetables are expensive because they've been shipped from overseas usually. They're normally imported. Um, and when foods are imported, they've spent a lot of time in refrigeration and a lot of time out of the ground. And the longer the time the vegetable or fruit stays out of the ground, the less nutrients they have. So go for seasonal fruit and vegetables is one of the best ways to do it. Um, and then chicken and eggs are generally a good option, although I know the prices of those are skyrocketing, but um, generally those are really good options as well. Um, when should one introduce water from a sippy cup? So um, a sippy cup can be introduced all the way from kind of seven or eight months old, as soon as your little one can hold with two hands um, and you can start to introduce it. And so you don't even ever need to give water in a bottle. Um, okay, so this is a great question. So, well, great comment. Um, I'm just gonna just, I'm not gonna read it out, but um, this mum is visually impaired and she wants to know whether or not the ParentSense app could um, have a voice over on the, on the iPhone. Um, it's not difficult to um, enable accessibility features. Um, and that is really an awesome piece of advice. Um, Estine, I'm definitely going to um, ask my, my um, team to put that in place. I know Alison's on the call tonight, she can make a note of it. And she wants to thank us for the Instant Pot recipes. Oh, that's awesome. So for those of you who have an Instant Pot, we have adjusted all of the recipes in our app to be able to be made in, in the Instant Pot. Kelly, hi Kelly. Um, when can babies, I think I know you Kelly, um, when can babies start drinking water and how much a day? And when can they start having rooibos tea? So water from any time once they're onto solids and formula together as opposed to breast milk. Um, and rooibos tea, you know, they don't really ever need rooibos tea, but if you want to put rooibos tea um, in, if you can go anywhere kind of, kind of from about eight, nine months onwards, you can start to add it in, but they don't need tea um, really at that age. Um, okay, another great question. Is yogurt a carb or a protein? Well, it's got both in it. Um, it has got both in it. Um, all right. Janine or Jean. Um, hi, Meg. This is great. 
Um, we're in the middle of the ready stage with our little girl. Brilliant. According to the checklist, she's definitely a social butterfly and it looks like the ready signs are there. We have introduced butternut, sweet potato and cucumber and she pulls her face as if it's a lemon. That is such an interesting thing. So, um, and this is one of the examples of when you kind of put something out there as babies are social butterflies or they're not, and this goes for their flavor and, and, and for other parts of their life. And then you get this one baby who does it differently. And yours is one of those, and she's not alone. There's lots of them who are actually social butterfly, gregarious, but around their mouth, they're a little bit more sensitive. And it often happens with little ones who, for instance, had nasogastric tubes when they were babies or were born prematurely, um, or for just a random reason. Um, so I would still be going with the butternut and sweet potato because those are our blandest flavors. Um, you might want to try just because she is a social butterfly. You might want to just step right out there and offer her something that's really kind of flavorful, like for instance, a mango and see whether or not how she reacts to that, because maybe it is that she's actually not loving the blandness of those ingredients. Okay, uh, Diane or Diane, uh, seven month old, how many meals should they be eating and what variety of food can they have? So at seven months old, they can have actually absolutely everything. So all ingredients, and we do that in the um, weaning sense range, we introduce all ingredients from quite early on and she can have all ingredients at that age. There's nothing that she should not be having except if she's allergic to it um, and honey. Those are the things that we don't like them having and then raw fish isn't great because we, we really do want cooked fish. Um, and how many meals should she be eating? So she'll be on, on three meals, breakfast, lunch, and supper, four milk feeds, and then potentially one snack um, mid-morning or mid-afternoon. Right, I'm now going to switch across to the chat because the chat hasn't had very much airtime. And um, I can see there are just uh, two questions there. Um, so I'll answer one of those, and then I'm actually going to go ahead and actually draw our winners for this evening. All right, so Jessica said, some people say that you should wean three vegetables at a time. Is it better to wean with individual veggies at first or jump right in and combine the three at a time? It really doesn't matter. And I think people sometimes overthink weaning. So um, if you've got butternut in the house, offer that. If the next day you've got butternut and sweet potato and a cauliflower, offer that. So you can put it, any of it together, any combination. Um, what we do do in the app is we actually talk you through very specifically um, what you can do each day and we add lots of variety quite quickly as we go through. All right. Um, okay, Joel says, Meg, does the Weaning Sense book um, give portion sizes based on how old your baby is? Yes, it does, Joel. But again, it really isn't very prescriptive because we don't want it to, do, to be too prescriptive. So um, you need to go with your baby's signals as well. Um, all right, so before I finish off, I am going to um, just um, share my screen once more. There we go. And I'm just going to talk a little bit through the range and which meals to choose. So um, right at the beginning of your weaning journey, just in terms of choosing meals, um, they are quite, you go for recipes that are quite similar to what we do for our slow to warm up babies. That's because we generally want the ones to start on a more bland diet, bland diet. That's how we usually start them. So that would be things like, um, the apple and butternut puree is a great option or green veggie purees, which is a combination of, of our um, baby marrows and, and so on. Um, otherwise, your apple, pear and baby marrow. So there we've got an apple and a pear, two fruits with baby marrow, which is a fabulous recipe um, to start with. Um, and then also things like our pear and coconut porridge, which is a much more bland um, recipe. So those are the ones you can go for. As your baby goes through that stage, you then want to start to introduce the allergens. And remember, we said don't wait too long for the allergens. You do want to have them introduced. So you can start to introduce your allergens. And that would be things like uh, the chicken and, and beetroot, although um, chicken's not a big allergen. It is a protein, though. Um, but an example would also be our butternut and peanut butter, which is a fabulous recipe to introduce quite soon after they've been in, they have had solids introduced. And then if you've got a social butterfly, you want to move very quickly onto the high texture, high flavor, and that would be um, our things like um, our roasted veggies and lentils or our lentil and um, sweet potato curry. Those are all examples of highly flavored foods that our social butterfly would love. And then moving on towards um, kind of eight months, you're going to really want to start to move them towards their texture challenges. So these are things like our beef and risotto. So our beef risotto is a fabulous recipe and that's got lots of texture in it. So that's the direction to go. You start with less flavor, less texture, you move through your allergens and then onto more flavor, more texture. And if they're social butterfly, you ramp that up a whole lot more. So I hope that little um, kind of illustration of how you move through solids um, is useful. Right, so with that, I'm going to start finishing off now. And I think that we have got um, a winner. 
So let's have a look. Um, aha, here we go. So we have a Weeding Sense course coming up. For those of you who don't know about it, it's a five-week course where Kath and I come alongside you. There are lectures every couple of days. We have Q&A sessions where we answer your questions. The course is absolutely amazing. So if you are looking at weeding right now, I do recommend it. And the great news is that we have got um, four winners who will actually win um, this prize. So the first winner is Kristen Redford. And the second winner is Nabila Simang, and then Pumi Garma, and then Ismat, sorry, it's just falling behind my screen here, Ismat Tahamid. So those are our four winners. All of you are winning a place on our course. Um, and for the rest of you, you're gonna, this is an Oprah moment. You are all going to have a voucher come to you tomorrow on email where you can go and experiment with the you cook baby food. So do go and experiment. They are selling it in, in 10 selected checker stores as well. So you can look out for it there. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining me. And before I head off, I do want Laveline to show her beautiful face again, just to thank her so much. Um, it's been wonderful having Laveline here with us. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for a great session. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for those of you who want to follow Lovely, and she's Mrs. Leo um, on Instagram. I love her account. Um, I love her very cute little bubba boy. He's too precious, Connor. Um, and so to all of you, thank you for joining Lovely and I. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Good night, everybody. And yes, I'm sure you'll get access to the recording. Those of you, I see all the questions coming through. Can we get the recording? I'm sure you will get, Michelle will organize that for you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.